Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Carl Creeder. I'm from the University of Iowa, and I'm a urologist there. My task this morning is going to be to cover some of these issues in uh, men. Those are my disclosures, and I'm self-funded for this meeting. So uh, the things I'm going to touch on today are uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, penile rehabilitation uh, after definitive therapy for uh, cancer of the prostate with either radiation or surgery. We'll talk a little about infertility and what patients might be interested in preserving fertility. Uh, we'll touch on LUTs and um, stricture management in these patients, and we'll finish with hemorrhagic cystitis. Now, I'm going to confine my comments to prostate cancer um, just because of the time and uh, because it's clearly the largest uh, group of patients affected. In the U.S., there's about 2.5 million men that have prostate cancer at any given time and 250,000 new cases diagnosed each year. Uh, as I said, the discussion is going to focus on those patients who have had definitive treatment with either a radical prostatectomy, and virtually all of the data I'll show is uh, with nerve sparing technique or uh, radiation therapy. Now, one of the problems with radiation therapy, there are a number of modalities, some uh, newer than others. The largest body of evidence is for external beam radiation therapy and brachytherapy, just because they've been around the longest. And when I present data from any of these others, I'll, uh, I'll point out what modality we're talking about. So uh, there's been a controversy in the literature uh, as to whether um, the dose of radiotherapy is uh, related to the, a higher incidence of erectile dysfunction. There were a number of articles that suggested it was and others that uh, suggested the contrary. This review looked at all of the literature, and uh, they graded the articles based on quality. And when they did that, uh, their conclusion was that there is an effect, uh, a dose effect. So more radiation equals more erectile dysfunction. And they measured the dose in the, uh, in the penile bulb. So having said that, the true incidence of erectile dysfunction after radiotherapy is unknown. It's been reported to be between 10 and 60%. It seems that the rates of uh, erectile dysfunction are similar for radiation therapy and radical prostatectomy. Uh, they are obviously vary by the age of the group that you're studying, the duration of follow-up in particular is important in the type of radiation. It seems clear that the onset of erectile dysfunction seems to be later in the radiotherapy group. After radical prostatectomy, it's usually immediate. But in many of the radiation series, the, um, the rate of erectile dysfunction does not start to pick up until you get three to five years uh, out from radiation. And the other thing that seems to be evident is that the brachytherapy uh, seems to preserve more erectile function than surgery or external beam radiation therapy. So um, one of the things that uh, was alluded to earlier was this concept of penile rehabilitation. And the goal here is to return erectile function to the pretreatment level. Uh, most of the studies have looked at men that have had radical prostatectomy. Uh, there is a lack of consensus on the ideal regimen, but there is agreement that the sooner you start, uh, the better. Uh, PD5's uh, intracavernosal injection and vacuum erection device are all options used for penile rehabilitation. Uh, many investigators think that PD5's are a critical component because of the effect they have on uh, penile blood flow. So this is just a, a summary slide of the uh, randomized controlled trials that have had positive outcomes in, in the literature uh, using um, penile rehabilitation. You can see the regimens vary somewhat as, as the outcomes, but there's some very uh, nice size uh, trials there. There are, however, a couple randomized trials, one quite large, that had uh, negative outcomes. and. There are some uh, prospective uh, non-randomized trials. The, those are listed here, and these all had positive outcomes. So on balance, I think the literature supports that this probably is worthwhile. It's relatively low risk. And the cost, although not insignificant, uh, is certainly not in the range of uh, some of the other costs that, uh, that we bear in medicine. So this is the regimen we use for penile rehabilitation. Uh, two to four weeks before their surgery, uh, we, we start them on a full dose of PD-5s, and then we alternate low and full dose, and then uh, out to the weekend, as you see there. 
and uh, when then we re begin this again uh, two to four weeks after the catheter is removed. We like to see them get about four to six erections a week, and we follow them every four months up to two years. Now, if they're not getting uh, good erections with that regimen, then we, um, we start intracavernosal injection therapy and alternate that with PD-5s, and if they still don't get a good response, uh, then we add the vacuum erection device in. Um, we continue this treatment for six months, and then we re-challenge them with the uh, PD-5s, and if that works, we switch them back to pills and again follow for two years. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, infertility and radiation therapy. Um, the testis is one of the most sensitive organs to radiation therapy, especially the germinal cells. At fairly low doses lead to irreversible azospermia. The injury can be from direct or scatter radiation, and uh, the seminal vesicles and prostate also produce suboptimal semen after radiation therapy. Um, in radiated patients, almost 20% of the dose may be uh, scattered and administered, administered to the testis. And additionally, there's scarring in the seminal vesicles, vas, urethra, and ejaculatory ducts after radiation therapy. A radical prostatectomy by its very nature uh, results in uh, infertility. So uh, I have to admit that when I looked in the literature, uh, I, you know, this is not one of the things that we think of first off when we're confronted with a prostate cancer patient. However, that, that may be a mistake because in this report, 495 patients with a mean age of 64 and a half, 20, fully 20% 20 were interested in sperm banking. And the patients who wanted to, the patients who wanted to bank sperm um, were uh, younger with an average age of 62 uh, versus 65. They were childless and they desired uh, fatherhood. Um, and you can see the rate there, 64 versus 9.3. I think the take home message is to remember to ask uh, if this is an issue because um, if you, uh, if you decide this is a, a potential a concern up front, sperm banking is relatively inexpensive. In our institution, it's about $300 for processing and $200 per year for storage. And even if they have retrograde ejaculation or they need an assisted technique, it adds a few hundred dollars to the, to the cost. Once you get into uh, uh, surgical techniques for extraction uh, after, um, after surgery or after radiotherapy, the cost goes way up. And this doesn't count uh, the IVF, which is by a definition required and can cost up to $20,000 a cycle. So um, the other topic I wanted to cover was radiation cystitis. So this is a, a general term uh, that covers everything from mild lower urinary tract uh, symptoms with uh, a minimal impairment to severe uh, symptoms with contracted bladder and hemorrhagic cystitis. Uh, the LUTs after radiotherapy are reported by about 20% of patients. They can often be due to a stricture, which is very important to discover. Incontinence relatively uncommon, but these patients do require a complete workup. And uh, therapeutic options are similar to non-radiated patients, but anticholinergic, uh, the artificial sphincter, and transurethral section of the prostate should all be used with caution in these patients. Uh, this is a, a paper that talks about LUTs after uh, a stereotactic body radiation um, and 200 uh, patients. And what it suggests is that the, uh, the worsening LUTs that you see after radiotherapy may improve given some time. In this report, 96% of patients re return to baseline by two years. This is an interesting paper from Herb Lepore's group. This is a, a prospective cohort study of almost 1,800 patients. These patients had radical uh, nerve sparing prostatectomy. They had follow up with AUA symptom score, you could see at 3, 6, 12 months and yearly out to 10 years. And then those patients, especially those who had uh, moderate symptoms at baseline, they showed significant improvement in LUTs that lasted uh, out to 10 years. Now these are um, uh, just some uh, examples of strictures you can see uh, after either radiotherapy or a radical prostatectomy. Uh, this series was patients who had radical prostatectomy with about 11% incidence. 73% um, were handled by dilation, and the success rate was 57%. Uh, Similar success rate for those who had an incision of the stricture. Um, over a quarter required uh, subsequent procedures, and the study was too small to identify risk factors for recurrence. So it seems that there's probably not a whole lot of difference between dilatation and incision, especially for the early strictures, and dilatation is probably a little bit safer and less likely to result in worse incontinence, especially if the stricture is near the sphincter.
Um, mitomycin has been used to inject when you make an incision in one of these strictures. Uh, the rationale for this is based on its use in ophthalmology and otolaryngology, where it has been shown to be effective uh, as an antiproliferative agent. Uh, and um, so it's, it's been uh, talked about in neurology. Some people use it routinely. I usually use it just for recurrences. There's no randomized trials at the present. Uh, the Uralum is uh, a stent, that, uh, urethral stent, that was out for many years. It's now off the market, but there's still a lot of patients that uh, have been treated with these, uh, for these uh, strictures. This is a series uh, from Jack McInich's group uh, that looks at the initial success rate in radical prostatectomy and radiation. You can see uh, the, uh, the rates are better for uh, radical prostatectomy, and then final success rates after subsequent procedures, including additional stent placement and uh, incision. And uh, one of the problems you can see with these that can, can be quite challenging, especially in the radiated patient, is, uh, is illustrated here. Uh, here's a stent that's not completely epithelialized, and you can see the stone that's formed in the urethra. And uh, this can be uh, very difficult to, uh, to deal with. These stents are very easy to put in, but, uh, but quite difficult to get out and quite difficult to manage. Uh, other techniques. Uh, patients are willing to do intermittent catheterization. That's a great technique if they'll do it. One, I think it keeps the stricture open longer, but the bigger issue is when they can't pass the catheter any longer, they call right away. So uh, we see them and, and they have much less of a stricture typically than if they wait until, uh, until they notice that their flow is decreased and so it's an easier thing to manage. I mean, you can put in a suprapubic tube in, but it has the usual problems of leakage and infection. The artificial sphincter for those who have incontinence after incision of one of these uh, sphincters is a, is a good option. Uh, typically, we wait at least six months to be sure that the, the stricture is stable and we're not going to have to uh, do anything further with it. And we use liberal um, use of the transcorporal uh, placement method described by uh, Webster. A real challenge is in patients who already have a sphincter and get a recurrent uh, stricture and a number of uh, innovative techniques, including cystostomy, uh, uh, pediatric resectoscope, and actually undoing the cuff and using a standard scope to avoid traumatizing uh, the cuff and damaging it. Posterior urethroplasty is sort of the court of final resort for these patients. Uh, here is a, a series from Tony Mundy and Daniela Andrich uh, of uh, 23 patients. They had good success in the non-radiated, less so in the radiated. They had 100% incontinence, and they all required an artificial sphincter. And a uh, similar number of patients described by McInich's group, again, they did better in the non-radiated than the radiated patients, and many of these patients uh, did require an artificial sphincter subsequently. And then I'll conclude with um, just a um, quick overview of hemorrhagic cystitis. So this occurs in about 10% of patients uh, after radiation therapy. It uh, typically can occur in the first few months out to decades. Reports of 15 and 20 years later uh, are in the literature. Uh, and the most data we have for, uh, for this particular malady is related to external beam and uh, brachytherapy. Um, the uh, approach to management is to look for other uh, causes, make sure there's not a coagulopathy. Uh, typically, we'll uh, scope the patients and then uh, do some for a bladder irrigation, and then there are uh, salvage therapies, which I'll discuss. One of the installations that's commonly used is alum. This was first described in the 1980s. It's administered as a 1% solution and a continuous irrigation, and several small series report success rates, someplace in the uh, 66 to 100% range. You have to watch for aluminum toxicity, especially in patients with renal impairment. In my experience, this works in the mildly affected patients, but not as well in those more severely affected. Uh, formalin. Uh, works pretty well. It's used usually in a 1, per two, uh, one to 2% solution. We'll go as high as 4%. If uh, we've used 1 or 2%, it works, and then they subsequently fail. Uh, we'll use 4%. Uh, anesthesia is required, um, and uh, typically we uh, look for a, a contact time of about 10 to 15 minutes. Now, the problem with formalin is it damages the bladder, and uh, although it has a high success rate, when you start getting up to these higher concentrations of 4%, this is often a segue to a radical cystectomy. Hyperbaric oxygen uh, has been described in a number of studies. Most are retrospective. The number of treatments varies between 20 and 45, and success rates are pretty good, 75 to 100 percent. Remember, this is usually a third-line uh, therapy. Some of the problems, it's not available everywhere, and it can be difficult to make these dives with patients that are on continuous bladder irrigation and, and bleeding. <clears throat> 
There are other one-off treatments. Uh, I have uh, very little experience with these, but estrogens, uh, uh, penicillin, polysulfate, uh, prostaglandin, flow seal has been described. There's even one case using an argon beam uh, coagulator uh, through a gastroscope, a green light laser, and balloon hydrodistension for up to six hours. Obviously, that's a segue to a cystectomy. And then, so this is just a summary of the uh, the algorithm we use, uh, initially rule out other causes, uh, cystoscopy, persistent uh, hematuria, then consider one of the installations. Uh, if you still have persistent hematuria, then uh, consider re scoping the patient and see if there's anything you can full grade or hyperbaric oxygen. And if that fails, you're either looking at embolization or a radical cystectomy. So in summary, I would say that uh, pelvic floor dysfunctions after surgery or radiation therapy are usually treatable. It's important important to know what a patient's uh, post-operative fertility expectations are. Uh, the incidence of erectile dysfunction from surgery and radiation therapy are probably similar in the long term. Uh, it seems that early penile rehabilitation is important and, and effective, and uh, the very challenging things we can end up having to treat are uh, hemorrhagic cystitis and strictures related to uh, either surgery or radiation therapy. Thank you. <laughs>